right, today we're going to be discussing Dominion. Dominion the spread. I mean, the title of the game is Dominion, so you'd think this is pretty important, but believe it or not, a lot of people are a little confused on this stuff. So let's knock out some of the serious stuff. Let's get one thing out of the way first. Unfortunately for us on Dead Folk, we really don't have a good chance at convincing the living to follow us. It, for undead nations such as middle-aged or more and similar reanimation nations, it's really not effective or even possible. That being said, we can usually raise, you know, true believers from underground whenever we want, so we kind of accept this downside. Secondly, let's talk about some other small stuff. I want to knock out the small stuff early. So there's a small benefit stealthy preachers receive that a lot of people don't really know about. It's not really that beneficial unless you profitize your initial scout, which is something you'd only do in very specific circumstances. But believe it or not, when you have a stealthy preacher in enemy lands, they actually form little mini cults, and those cults protect them. The larger the population in a province, the higher the stealth bonus you gain, but this is only active while you are actively preaching. So be aware just running around through enemy lands, you won't be protected from this. Now, again, let's talk about smaller things. Inquisitors, heretics, random things about water, etc. So Inquisitors, if you ever see the Inquisitor tag on a unit, like you will with Marignan's High Priests, they're treated as double their effective priest level whenever preaching against enemy faiths or dominions, not when just spreading normal dominion through preaching. So keep that in mind. Inquisitors are really good at knocking down enemy dominion, but not any better than a normal preacher at spreading your own dominion. Heretics reduce all dominions in a province. So if your enemy dominion is super high in a province, it's really difficult, as we'll see later with the numbers, to preach it out. But with a heretic, you're virtually guaranteeing you can reduce all dominion in that province. And if it's enemy dominion, hey, you just reduce their dominion and made it easier for you to preach it down. Now, when it comes to water and land provinces, it's very difficult to spread from land to water or water to land. It's not difficult because there's some magical penalty to your preaching check. It's just every time you successfully roll a temple check to spread into a water province from land or a land province from water, you have a 50% chance of it rebounding back to another like province. So if you're in the water trying to preach to to land and you succeed, there's a 50% chance even though you succeeded, it will instead bounce to another water province and so on. They can actually bounce really far. So that's why sometimes you'll get really stretched out dominion scores far, far away because they'll just bounce, 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 bounce and refuse to go in the water or the land, whichever one's opposite from your province that currently has it. That being said, if you get lucky enough as a water nation to spread onto land or as a land nation to spread onto water, put a preacher in there and have him spam that preaching out with a temple because that's your best chance to get the rest of those style provinces around there. Another Another small note, early age and late age Mictlan Dominion doesn't naturally spread through temple checks without sacrifice. There might be some other nation I'm not thinking of, but these are just a really obvious nation to talk about. They cannot preach. They can't do normal preaching. So keep in mind, in a bit when we talk about preaching, we're not going to be able to utilize those strategies. So for early age and late age Mictlan, it's very, very painful to take a low Dominion score. And I'll explain why with the numbers a little bit later. Just be aware, as early age or late age Mictlan, you really, or any other nation that doesn't naturally spread spread dominion, you really, really need to consider a higher dominion during your pretender creation. And finally, conflict bonus. This is something I've seen a lot of confusion of. I saw a bunch of years ago, I think it was Dom4 Lucid asking about this and nobody really had a good answer and it's always just kind of stuck in the back of my mind. So I went through and I tested it the best I could. Sure seems like it's a little different than most people expect and it sort of jumps around the dominion, max dominion score of 10 in a way, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. I just wanted to touch on it briefly here so people knew that we were going to talk about it and what it was. Let's get started talking about the actual calculations. The maximum dominion in any of your provinces, this is something that's important to know, is that your maximum dominion in any individual province is based on, you know, assuming you don't have a random event raising it, is based on your maximum dominion score of your pretender. This is determined during pretender creation, but also raised for every five temples you build by plus one. So if you have a pretender and during creation you give them seven dominion score, and then you have, let's say, five temples, now you can have a max dominion score of eight. If you have 10 temples, you can have nine. If you have 15 temples, you can have 10. That would be the max. You can't go beyond that. You can't go up to 20 temples for 11. That being said, keep in mind, each temple makes a temple check every turn. So it increases the chances that your dominion will rise to that maximum of 10 or nine or eight per turn. Now with temple checks, the base formula of temple checks increasing dominion and spreading dominion is 50% plus your maximum pretender's dominion times 5%. So if you have a 10 dominion, 10 times 5% is 50%. 50% plus 50% is obviously 100%. That's the best you can get. But if you have a dominion score that's relatively low, like four, you only have a 20% bonus from that dominion score. So it's only a 70% chance to increase dominion. And that's assuming you're not battling an enemy dominion, which we'll get into here in a second. Very straightforward when you're in neutral provinces and just spreading your own dominion. 
but it gets a little complicated when we get into Dominion conflicts. Now let's discuss where temple checks come from every month. That way you understand a temple check is something you need to understand is different than a temple, and it comes from things other than temples. If your pretender's awake and running around, he gets one guaranteed successful check that he spreads your Dominion at least one time around him, but he also gets two temple checks as if he was a temple making those checks we just talked about every turn. You get another check from your prophet, or in a disciple game, you would get it from your disciples. Because if you're in a disciple game, you could technically have five disciples, each one being treated like a prophet, but you can't make your own prophet. So disciple or prophet, those are interchangeable here. You also get one from your capital province, your named province. If you're Marverni, it comes from Marverni. If you're Makona, it comes from Makona, etc. You get another check each turn from each temple. Every throne when claimed gives you at least one, I believe. I can't think of one that doesn't. There might be conflict bonus penalties from thrones, but they still spread. But it's all the way up to, I think it's seven checks at the top end for thrones that really hard push your dominion. And then every time you do a blood sacrifice on a nation that's capable of blood sacrificing, believe it or not, it's actually not calculated as preaching. It's calculated as temple checks. This is obvious because preaching can only work in your current province, whereas temple checks can spread out to other neighboring provinces. We're going to get deep in the weeds on that in a little bit. And where temple checks do not come from is preaching priests. A lot of people don't realize this, but a preaching priest has a different formula completely from a temple check. So the temple check on the province where a preacher is preaching is completely different than the preacher's check himself. So let's go dive into that. All right, so now we're talking actual temple check numbers. Temple checks depend on the current state of the province in the question. The base to increase is 50% plus that 5% times your max dom strength, you know, 100% if you have a 10 dom strength. If you are successful at this, then you check the following. If it's a neutral province, you'll get an automatic plus one to your score in that province. Fairly easy. If the province is already friendly, then the chance to increase that dominion is 30% minus 3% times your current friendly dominion. That means at the minimum, if you only have dominion one in there, you only have a 27% chance of raising it, which is pretty good. Every turn you have a 27% chance of raising it until it hits dominion two. <laughs> But if you already have Dominion 9 there, you only have a 3% chance of raising it to 10. If the province already has enemy Dominion, it gets a little more complicated, but to simplify, it's basically 5% bonus for each side. If you have 5 DOM score there, or, well, technically it has enemy Dominion, so it's just minus 5% per DOM score they have there. So it's a base 50% chance to reduce their Dominion. Remember, this is not to add your Dominion, it is to reduce enemy Dominion. And it's 50% plus your max DOM score times 5% minus current enemy DOM score score, not max, times 5%. So if you consider it a 5% battle for each way for each of yours, it'd be your max dom versus their current dom to reduce theirs. So the advantage usually goes towards you, unless it's a huge discrepancy in power. So if the enemy has only a one dom score in the province, but you have a maximum dom score of 10, you have a 95% chance of dropping theirs down. If the enemy dominion in that province is 10, however, and you only have a dominion score of one, you've only got a 5% chance of dropping theirs down. So this can obviously take a long time if somebody has dominion score beefed up. Keep in mind later, I'm going to talk to you guys about strategies of boosting your outlying provinces dominion scores through preaching. This is where that factors in because if you have a dominion score of seven, that's minus 35%. That helps against preaching in a big way, but it also helps prevent people from spreading into your provinces with their dominion. Let's talk about the basics of preaching because preaching, as I mentioned before, is completely different than temple checks. Preaching completely ignores your pretender's dominion strength. So this benefits you in a big way if you have a low dominion during creation, but this, it, it's kind of like an equalizer, but it's a big disadvantage to high dominion nations because you could build a pretender with dominion 10 as their base score and you won't get any benefit from this for that. It'll just be the exact same. Now you'll obviously get benefits in other ways, but in terms of specifically preaching to raise the province that you're in, in your friendly dominion or reducing enemy dominion, this you don't get any benefit from it from your base pretender's dominion strength. And one note I put here is this does not affect blood blood sacrifices because they're treated as temple checks, not as preaching. And thank goodness, because if they were, Miklin, early age and late age, Miklin and similar nations would not be able to spread their dominion more than one province at a time. They would actually have to build a temple in literally every single province and sacrifice there to be able to <laughs> spread their dominion at all. That would be a nightmare. Now the preaching base formula to raise dominion score in your province that you're standing in with the preacher is 30% times the priest level minus the enemy dominion times 5%. Now the priest level gets a one half level bonus if you have a temple in that province. And the reason it's half is because the multiplication there gets a little funny because 30% times, say, a level one priest all by himself 
is 30% chance with no enemy dominion. A level one priest with a temple is a 45% chance. So it, it becomes fairly important whether you have a temple there or not, especially when you start factoring in enemy dominion. So this is to a maximum of twice your priest level. So if you have a level one priest in a province, the max he can raise your dominion score to there is two. Now, if you have a temple there, that means he is treated as a 1.5. So the max dominion score you can raise him to is a three there. Now I gave some minimum examples here against enemies and all this sort of thing. You guys can read through these but basically with a level one priest versus 10 enemy dominion score you have a five percent chance to preach and reduce theirs by one it's pretty limited but if you have a level five priest with a temple going against barely any enemy dominion you're guaranteed to reduce their dominion score or raise yours ridiculous example because it's a level five priest with a temple i mean could you work harder on that maybe but i doubt it so keep in mind this is independent of the actual temple checks in the province though so if you've built a temple in one of the little examples i gave up a Above. If you actually built a temple, then that temple, after you've reduced their score with preaching, will have a better or worse chance based on your success to actually spread your dominion. So that's something really beneficial is if you have a temple there, it really exponentially increases your success levels. Now, here's what we all really wanted to get to, right? The basic strategies based on these numbers. So this is basic strategies. If you're in a game and you know that you have a low dominion strength or a high dominion strength, you should play completely differently, in my opinion. And this actually becomes very important because if you have a lower dominion, strength, say three, four, or five, and you don't adjust your strategy to take this into account, you can easily be Dom killed. And I don't specifically mean Dom killed in you lose the game because you have no dominion. It's easy to keep one or two provinces with your dominion, you know, with your pretender or your capital city, but it's very difficult to win battles if you're always fighting an enemy dominion. And it's very difficult to make money if you're always sitting in enemy dominion because their positive scales turn into negative scales for you. So keep in mind, if you have a low dominion strength, the number one thing I recommend is Pay attention to it and hurry. Rush all over the place to get priests, get them preaching in outlying provinces. The reason you want to rush priests and have them preach is because it's independent. The preach check is independent of your individual dominion score. So preaching on your outlying provinces is very good. If you blitz out and get, say, eight to ten provinces and you're sitting in all of your outlying provinces preaching, preaching, preaching with the highest level preachers you can get, you have a really good chance of raising your dominion score very, very high, which then prevents the enemy from dominating pushing you as hard and it can actually give you a really good solid wall of defense i gave some examples here if you have a level two priest without a temple you only have a 60 percent chance to raise your dominion in that province to a maximum of four and remember with that five percent penalty to enemies that's a maximum of 20 percent penalty to their checks to knock your dominion down. But if you get it with a temple, you can get it up to five. That's a 25% reduction. All the way up to with a level three priest with a temple, you can get to a dominion score of seven, which gives them a 35% penalty on preaching and similar things. So if somebody comes over to try to preach you out of their neighboring province and you have a seven dominion score and they're preaching in that seven dominion province, they're gonna have a 35% penalty. So they really need a level one priest to be upgraded to at least a level two. And some nations just don't have good access to level two and level three priests. So this could become a big factor for you. This is a big way to control your external dominion scores because for the most part, without random events, dominion scores don't hop. They have to go province to province. So it's good to have an outlying wall of high dominion score. I would say you can start relaxing around dominion six and seven in your outlying provinces, but it's much easier to maintain dominion six and seven in your outlying provinces as long as you get there earlier than other nations and you get your dominion score preached up before they have a chance to push in. If you have a high dominion strength, the ways you can abuse this are you don't need to preach as much because you don't get as much of a benefit from preaching. You still can to battle particular provinces, but create more opportunities for temple checks because that's where you get a big advantage. Rush a profit, try to get a profit as early as possible. And anytime your profit dies, make sure you maintain that profit by making another person a profit. Think about having an awake pretender to rapidly get three temple checks per turn, one guaranteed and the two temple checks that are normally checked. And consider Dom killing nearby opponents. Remember I mentioned earlier with chaff in battles, chaff usually have a morale score of 10, sometimes nine, sometimes 11, but usually right around 10. So a minus two morale swing is a huge deal for chaff, especially with all of the agony spam and bloodletting spam going on in battles, because for chaff to start retreating, that's a massive amount of HP that just starts running from a battle simply because you're getting a minus two morale swing. Because remember, if you're fighting in friendly dominion, you get a plus one. If you're fighting an enemy dominion, you get a minus one. That's a minus two swing for morale. So it's a big, big, big strategy you can follow through. Next, I'm going to go dive into that conflict bonus testing. As we've covered most of the basics here, we've got a lot of numbers here. Feel free to book 
bookmark little spots on this video and bring up these pages so you can look at the numbers because being able to calculate out the percentages here makes it a lot easier for you to strategize instead of just guessing. Now let's go check out the conflict bonus testing that I did as I think we found something that a lot of people have been questioning for quite some time. All right, boys, and I've always been curious about this myself, whether conflict bonus actually mattered once you had topped out Dominion or not. So I chose McCone here. As you can see, McCona has a conflict bonus of plus one and their opponent here, Marverni, does not. And what I did was I started both with a Titan and I made darn sure that they didn't have any Dominion spreading bonuses or anything here. And I ran through to turn 110 just to see the Dominion spread. And I went through and manually counted every single province here and counted the Dominion scores. And it seems pretty definitively positive. And this is the fourth time I've run this test. It's pretty definitive that the conflict bonus of plus one does benefit these guys after, even after Dominion score 10. I had always assumed that if you hit Dominion score 10, conflict bonus would not factor in. And I saw a couple forum posts about people, even Lucid a couple years ago, talking about it. And nobody really came up with definitive answers. Every time I've done this test, in this example, for example, you have a total of 80 land-based Dominion candles for Makona. And if you look around, it's a fairly balanced map, right? Right down the middle. We have Marverni over here. We have Makona over here. And Makona is just dominating. They have 80 land Dominion candles and two water candles. The water, obviously, with the 50% chance to deflect somewhere else, very rarely gets any Dominion dominance. So it's 1-1 one, one for Marverni, 1-1 one, one for Makona. On the land, Makona has 80 Dominion candles, and Marverni only has 65 after 110 turns. And if that's not an... I mean, that, you know, plenty of random chance could come into this and factor in, but it most definitely does not benefit Makona or Marverni. I haven't had it benefit Marverni one single time in this run, and I've tested it with other province i've tested it with other nations and it's turned out to basically be the exact same so it's not a marverni particular thing it just seems like conflict bonus even if you both already have a 10 dominion score and only one temple and you're a pretender and no profit it seems like you're getting a huge benefit from conflict bonus so that's something to keep in mind if you're at the top 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 end of dominion pushing and you're against someone like micklin who has to manually push their dominion or somebody who's really vulnerable for example niflheim or abyssia who really needs their dominion to spread for their temperature scales to spread. If you're against somebody like that, having a nation like Makona, especially, for example, against nations that are fire-based, Makona has a lot of fire-resistant troops and fire-based spells, the ability to cast fire-resistant spells on their troops. It might give you a good reason to pick a nation like Makona, especially now that my guide's out. <laughs> so if you keep that in mind, at the top, top, top end, it will make a big difference. And the other thing is, if you're looking through spells, level 7 Thaumaturgy, Gigantomachia, this gives you a plus three conflict bonus. This makes it huge for Makona and Flegra in the Middle Age and Late Ages to hardcore Dominion push people. Now I'm going to go ahead and run the exact same test, but I'm going to rush Gigantomachia and see the difference just so we can get a little more definitive look at it. All right, and here's the follow-up. So we did the uh, same game, Makona versus Marverni, and we had Makona a couple turns ago cast Gigantomachia, which gives obviously the plus three conflict bonus. Now keep in mind, we're in both nations already have Dominion score 10, base Dominion score 10 to remove any variables. Nobody's preaching. We don't have any profits, just pretenders. Both are big, awake, expanding fat guys. No special events, nothing. Well, possibly a special event because we have a 9 Dominion here. But if you look at the difference now with Gigantomachia, even with Dominion 10 against Dominion 10, you are getting a province differential of 113 for Makona, with 98 on land and 15 on water, they're starting to take over the water, and only 39 Dominion Candles for Marverni. A huge swing. So it's very obvious that conflict bonuses can surpass the 10 Dominion strength. So what I would wager is instead of raising your effective Dominion strength, 10 is probably the cap for Dominion strength, this is my guess, but when you have a conflict bonus, since it doesn't actually describe a bonus to spreading your Dominion to begin with, it just describes a bonus in suppressing enemy Dominion, I feel like it just reduces reduces the effective Dominion score of the enemy whenever the two Dominions bump into each other, as opposed to raising your own Dominion score. That would be the only way that would work here, because if it raised your Dominion score, but there's a cap at 10, it wouldn't have any effect once everyone was at 10. But now that you have reduced their score, it'd be like Marverni is at a 7 Dominion and Makona is at a 10, which would demonstrate something like this. Something to keep in mind as well is when you're making your Pretender, if you are struggling with Dominion score, understand that a 10 Dominion score versus a seven dominion score is not that big of a difference. If you're having a huge, a huge 
battle difference and somebody picked five dominion and somebody picked eight because they're a little more sacred unit focused or something similar you might not think that's that big of a deal but look at the difference 113 candles versus 39 candles look all over the map how far makona gets that plus two morale swing that you normally get from dominion and you might actually start thinking about the actual dominion score itself being a power multiplier because even now makona is pushing all the way out to here to reach through mudwood and mark and punch right through so marverney's kind of trapped in its little dominion. So everywhere outside of these, what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight provinces, Marverney's suffering a minus two morale swing, which is huge for chaff, especially with chaff battles. So you just have to keep in mind a small dominion difference in dominion score is potentially a huge difference depending on what you guys are trying to do. Remember, there are other bonuses. If your pretender isn't fighting in your dominion, he's suffering huge bonus bonuses to his attack, damage, everything else, and he's not getting the benefits of his bless. Same with the profit. So you really need to keep in mind which dominion score you go with especially if somebody in the nation or in the game has a conflict bonus available to them and this is another huge disadvantage for a nation like end because they have that penalty to their conflict bonus which means essentially there's no way to overcome that at the high end of dominion battles now that's assuming everybody gets up to dominion 10 doesn't happen often in fact I would say it happens very rarely, but something to keep in mind. So when you guys are digging your way through this data and deciding on what you're determining your starting dominion is going to be with your pretender, keep this in mind. Yes, it's always theoretically possible to build multiple temples to catch back up, but remember, each one of those temples is three to 600 gold you need to protect, and that's assuming they all stay up. You know, if you're in a serious dominion battle for a couple provinces, and somebody takes out one temple and you lose that, you know, plus one dominion score because now it brought your extra temples down to four instead of five, you could be losing certain battles because of that. You know, a plus two morale swing is huge for chaff, especially if fear plays are being spammed out, which it's Dominion 6. We all know fear plays are going to be spammed out. So keep this in mind when you guys are battling back and forth, and maybe this will help you keep track of conflict bonuses and make it another element of your game that you can abuse. Because I'll tell you what, in an equal battle back and forth, Makona is going to win this one hard. Because remember, Marverni in particular, their boar generation rate from their master boars is going to depend on the Dominion score. So you've right now, just by Dominion pushing Marverni reduce the amount of boars that they're going to be able to bring to each battle. No matter what, Marverni could have more provinces, but if they have less Dominion, they're going to have less boars. And Marverni with less boars, we all know how that ends. All right, boys, let me know if you have anything else you want to see in the future. I'm going to be uploading a few more games. I played Warframe this week. I'm going to be uploading a few playthroughs of that, see if any of you guys dabble in that game. So let me know down in the comments if you've done any particularly nasty Dominion wins or Dominion battles showing up with three or four level three priests and blood sacrificing your way to victory or anything like that. Let me know in the comments and I'll see you guys on the next video.